Today is a special shakedown, two parts. First, our visit to the Baltimore Grand Prix to look into how a street course changes the racing experience. Drive had a camera there for one day. Turns out it was the key day, you'll see. Then part two is our weigh-in on the story that started to emerge from Baltimore about the American Le Mans Series Grand Am sports car racing merger. John DeGuise of Speed.com broke the story, did the journalistic heavy lifting, and earns himself the right, or the penalty, to join us here on Shakedown to talk about what's happening, what he knows, and what we can all expect from the rumored Wednesday official announcement. Now this could be the greatest thing since the invention of the condom, or as dangerous as unprotected sex. When we all come back, from this break, we'll all go to Baltimore. After break two, we'll Skype in with John and the ALMS Grand Am story. By the way, I'm wearing a condom right now. The event itself last year did not look like a first year event. If you'd said that it had been holding an event here for 10, 15 years, I would have completely believed it. The amount of uptake and interest from the locals was absolutely outstanding. Were there some problems? Were there some teething issues? Yeah, there were. Um, I think it's very brave that given what's happened with the original promoters, the city has decided to stick with it. I think it's the right decision. I think you only had to look at the crowds last year to believe it's the right decision. So the problem with the racetrack is another track the light rail track. On the far end, they've paved over it to make it smooth, but they've left this rail exposed on the front straightaway. The speed bump has become a launching ramp. The compression is making the cars get in the air. The LMP car has broken a suspension, and the Indy cars are going airborne. They're grinding the tracks. This is not gonna work. They're gonna have to go to that chicane. I see out there that if you look at the pro profile of the pavement, the front edge before you get to the tracks is just enough of a lip that it bottoms out and launches the car. So I believe, for example, the things that we've been discussing, there would be some pavement required to go in there, but it would be very risky because it's still completely unproven. So if we put pavement in there tonight and that didn't fix the problem, we're sitting here having the same conversation tomorrow. So I think um, as much as I'd rather have pavement than a chicane, our best option, since we proved it worked last year, is to put a chicane back in. The front straightaway challenge aside, maybe we'll talk about that at the end, because you're gonna go out and have to qualify. Talk to me about driving this street course and, and really how you have to attack it differently than maybe a regular road course that came from Road America. Jan, maybe start with you. What's, what's your approach? Well, obviously, you have, to, you have to be a little bit more careful when you're learning the grip levels and the lines. Uh, just because there is no, there's no curves and then a bit of runoff, it's, uh, it's, it's, there's a big penalty for making mistakes here. So yeah, just approach it a little bit more on the safe side and don't roll as much speed through the middle as you probably like, ultimately. But uh, you'll get there at the end, but it just, you just work up to it a little bit, uh, a little bit slower. And then you'll be looking for where is the grip in the track, where's the bumps, what to stay away from and what can you use. And, Stuff well, a bumpy track like this, which is sort of extreme, it's artificial really, it's not that the place is that bumpy, it's just the way it's configured, it needs a little bit more work to make it uh, raceable. But you know, these cars can run all day long on this surface, it's just not, not good for good racing. So they need to make them a little bit smoother, but you try to get grip wherever you can, it's all about grip, uh, you've got to be on the road to feel the grip, so you've got to keep it on the deck and you're looking for that grip. Last part, jumping to IndyCar, you said the similarity in the philosophy of setup, but is this the biggest challenge for this new IndyCar, the, this track here? No, I wouldn't say it was the biggest challenge, I think it's just part of the uh, toolbox you have of configurations that you apply to the car. I mean, these cars, um, they run a lot closer to the ground than these, and uh, when you look at the aerodynamics on an Indy car, you know, the whole floor is a big wing, and you've got these wings front and rear, a lot of wings, so they have a lot of downforce. So, you know, they, they jump up and down, you lose the downforce, so pitch sensitive is a little bit of an issue, but your speeds are a lot slower here, so it's just about keeping the wheels on the ground and the grip. Sounds familiar, right? Two things you need to do as a race car driver, find the shortest distance, find the fastest distance. Kind of number three, you find every trick you can to get those first two accomplished. I'm fixated on the chicane, because already in the first session, the quick drivers are already figured out. You put the center of the car on the first part of the berm, jump the berm, gives you a better corner in, faster to traction, better corner out through the chicane. 
when you broadcast a race like this, are you looking for particular things to kind of evoke what's going on in the racer's head on a street course? I think the difference about a street course is that we get um, much more of a feel of the speed of what's going on because there are things closer to the cars, the edge of the track, the concrete, the catch fencing that gives you a visual clue as to just how quick these cars go. Take them out into the wide open spaces, particularly of somewhere like a Silverstone, which I've just come back from, or a Formula One type circuit in Europe, and it's difficult to place in your mind and have your eyes see just how quick these cars are moving. Pretty obvious the success of a street race like Baltimore, transitioning the city into a racetrack is all about attention to detail and a lot of work. But just like everything in racing, all that preparation, you're still on the knife edge of success or failure. But this event has a huge popularity, even in the city and with all the racing community. Unlike Detroit, when the fans walked away when the track had a problem, the fans stick around, the racers want this to happen. And that speaks to the tenacity of the mayor to bring investors back in and keep this race going. And guys like Andretti and his marketing team and his racing team to bring their experience, their expertise, to bring this race back and bring it to life. So that was our visit to the Baltimore Grand Prix to find out about a street course and how it affects the road racing experience. While we were there, we also found one of our friends from the racetrack, John DeGuise from Speed.com. He's a reporter, he's a journalist, he's a photographer, he's a videographer all about racing. John, first of all, about that videography stuff, um, behalf of drive you got to stop doing that okay we don't um, need the competition we'll, we'll see about that later. yeah uh-huh but john's on here because he broke a story that's really big in the world of sports car racing john why don't we just start by you telling the shakedown crowd what is the story you broke we're expecting an announcement wednesday in daytona beach that will confirm the the merger of the american Le Mans series and grand am rolex sports car series likely by 2014. Well, without, without breaching your confidentiality, the integrity of reporting, we'll get into more of the details, or at least I'll try to, but let me, let's, let's set the tone. Um, do you feel this is a good thing, or, oh my God, let's all duck, this is going to be potentially bad? Where, where do you feel this is headed? Overall, I think it's a great thing for the sport. You know, I think we've all been sort of striving to see one series combined in, in, in unison, but I think it'll be a challenging next few years and, and seeing how the two series will integrate. You know, there's a lot of questions still to be answered. What's the class structure? How many races? Um, who's going to be in charge? Um, does this include the sale of, of the uh, Road Atlanta and the lease of the Sebring International Raceway? It, are, will any IMSA staff need to be moving over to Grand Dam? What's the series even going to be called? Do we know it's still going to be called Grand Dam? There, there's, there's a lot of questions coming in, in the pipeline for the, the next few months. And I think we'll get some of those answers on Wednesday. Let me back up, because you made a comment earlier um, to your, your followers that you were at Silverstone for the WEC race, and you saw Grand Am and ALMS people there. Is there any global involvement? I mean, FIA seemed to have built a relationship with NASCAR or Grand Am, NASCAR Holdings or Grand Am, and obviously ACO via Le Mans is part of the American Le Mans series kind of structure. Any global aspect to this that we should be thinking about? I'm not sure yet. You know, really? I really don't know how this will play out. Um, I know the ALMS has one year remaining on its ACO contract. I believe they just renewed it in June. So the, the, the sanctioning agreement with the ACO goes through the end of 2013. So I think that might be part of the reason why the ALMS still has to be around next year to fulfill that agreement. Beyond that, I, I really have no idea how this will be moving going forward. Um, wishful thinking would be, be great to see some kind of Le Mans component inside the new series, you know, to have teams over in the States have an easy access to the 24 hours of Le Mans, but I'm not convinced that'll happen, you know. We've seen in the past that Grand Dam strives to be a premier national championship, and while they have a lot of races on the international stage, and, and they're trying to grow their, their fan base through that with the North American Endurance Championship, I, I just don't know how, you know, an LMP2 car or, or a GTE car can be run in a, in a unified Grand Dam series without any modifications, unless there's significant changes made to the other existing Grand Dam classes that if or would be retained. So John, from your, from your investigation reporting, who was involved in this discussion and, and decision process? Um, was it cigars at the top with Don Panos and someone from the fa France family? Was um, ALMS Grand Dam 
NASCAR Holdings management involved? Were the manufacturers involved? Was there team input? Who do you think was involved in bringing this together and providing input? I think it was a combination of the both. You know, I, I think it all started probably with the, the top series executives, you know, the, the CEOs, the presidents of the, of the championships, and then it probably trickled down to, to some manufacturers. I do know that a, a few manufacturers may have been left in the dark over this. Um, I can't disclose who or, or, or what, what, who they may be, but um, I think that um, some of the closest series partners had some kind of a say, or at least were told in advance of when this was going to be coming down. And you think that was true at the team level too, some of the key teams on both sides? I'm not convinced on the team level. I think maybe some of that information may have trickled down from the manufacturers to the teams. Um, that's just an educated guess right now at this point. Have you heard anything about the Le Mans 24 entries that are part of the ALMS structure? Not right now. All I know is that the ALMS has three auto invites to give out at the end of this year, and they're at-large entries. So in last year, I think they had about eight or nine entries to give out, class winners of Petit Le Mans, champions of, the, of the, each class. Um, this year, they were scaled back under their new agreement for just three auto invites, and it's up to the ALMS slash IMSA to decide who to hand those out to for next year. Has there been any discussion about the type of cars, or are we premature, or are we going to learn more about it on Wednesday? And before you answer, let me preface that if you look at lap times, I mean, basically, here's where we sit. And LMP1 and 2 are the fastest cars. If I look at Road America laps, they're doing 152s, 156s, P1 and P2. LMPC from the America Le Mans series is a 158.59. A DP at Road America is about a two, two-minute lap. In the GT side, the America Le Mans GTs are quick at a 205 around Road America. GT from Grand Am is only as quick as a GTC car, and that's frankly, up at around the 213, 14, 212 ranges. Have you heard anything about how these are all going to come together, or is there going to be a big sale of cars that no longer have a place to race? Yeah, that's the big question right now as well. Um, I've heard some rumblings of how the class structure could be. I think it's safe to say we'll, we'll see some kind of a mix between Grand Am and, and ALMS classes, but the big question is how. Um, I, I think it's safe to say that, that LMP1 will probably go away, at least in its current form, because A, they're too fast, and there's too few of them in the States. There's only three cars right now, and I don't see any more on the horizon. Um, in Daytona prototypes, I think we'll see those cars definitely stay. You know, that's the, the marquee class for, for the Rolex series, and they've just gone over the, with a whole new um, remake of the body styles, and, and there's um, some more manufacturers in the pipeline for that as well, and in terms of creating manufacturer-specific bodywork and, and some engine developments in, in the pipeline. I'll be the one that'll say... I'll be the one that'll say Ford. I'll be the one that'll say that they told me that the Roush uh, EcoBoost V6 twin turbos online are going to come out. So you're right. There are things happening. Yeah, that's one of them. <laughs> Thank you for confirming. Uh -huh. um, you, know, you and I both know there's been a lot of discussion of GT3 spec and a lot of discussion of Pro-Am classes. If you look at Grand Am, I could make the argument that there's a lot of Pro-Am in that. And the discussion of ALMS to have particular classes has been percolating. Any of that do you think factors into that, this, uh, impending? I, yeah, I think it's very important to have a pro-am aspect of it. This, that's something that Grand Am really has been lacking in previous years. They didn't have a separate class for a championship. Obviously, they had the Truman and Aiken Awards, which was you know kind of like a, a little race within a race situation. But it really discouraged a lot of the gentlemen drivers from the sport, especially in Daytona prototype. I can count almost a list of a dozen drivers that have left DPs over the last six years and gone to race somewhere else because they didn't have a chance of winning against the likes of Ganassi and Gainsco and SunTrust with all pro driver lineups. So I think it's very important to have uh, uh, a pro-am class, at least maybe one in prototype and one in GT as well, to, to encourage participation on that end. And I think that's what we've seen the American Le Mans series grow and prosper in the recent years. You know, having um, LMPC, GTC, and then LMP2 come back online with, uh, with some uh, pro-am components as well. So. If we're starting with a clean sheet of paper in GT, I think it would be great to see a GT3 class over there, Pro-Am, and have some kind of like a, and the other class would be some kind of a ACO, ALMS, GTE category, which my personal opinion would be untouched. I'd love to see that, you know, be pure, uh, a pure GTE class like we've seen in the, well, the States and, 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 and worldwide. And here's my piece about, about cars. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the, the racing and competition matters, but the manufacturers are here to sell cars and sell race cars. And what you just mentioned would kind of speak to that, but if it's not a global spec, 
um, that makes it a challenge. And I know that companies like BMW and Porsche have been working really hard to find a unified spec to build less versions, but still sell cars. And I'd argue that our phone call to Ford would be really easy to justify building a GT3 type Mustang for this next generation since they're trying to make that a little more of a global brand. But I digress and I think we're on the same page. I'm, I'm sorry. And I think we're on the same page in terms of having a, uh, a unified spec for something that manufacturers can build against. Yeah, I think a unified spec would be, be great to see, and it has to be a global platform. You know, That's why I've been sort of a big pusher of the GT3 platform as of late, because you've seen how successful it has been in all parts of the world, pretty much except the, the North America. So it's, I think that's kind of a good plug-and-play situation for now, but maybe that can evolve in, in, the, in the future. You know, GT2 or, or GTE slash GT, whatever you want to call it, that's a very successful platform right now, and in the States particularly, but you look in the WEC, there's only five entries in GTE Pro. So is that really sustainable in the long run? But then you have other manufacturers like Viper just jumping in building a GTE car. Then BMW is looking at um, probably doing a Z4 GT, um, GTE car. Um, Audi's been rumored to be um, developing a, uh, a GTE car. You know, So I think all these sanctioning bodies have to get together and come to a common agreement on what platform of, of cars there, there should be. Because you know, if you make a specific car for each series, a specific, a specific class for each series, there's going to be no common link between the different championships worldwide. And while this, during this merger, if we're starting off on a fresh sheet of paper, I think it's important to, to get that going right now. I can tell you that some of the people that I spoke to in Baltimore after your article broke, their look in the eye was either, please, Leo, don't ask me because I'm under an NDA, or don't ask me because I'm pissed off I don't know. So, I mean, you've, you've kind of lit the wick and, and made everyone be aware of what they need to do to communicate and move ahead because the last thing we need is a lot of unknowns. It's time to plan for the future, 2013. And in a bigger picture, um, something's got to happen.